the true crime behind the making of the first Scream movie. If you haven't heard it yet, go give it a listen. This week, I'll be talking about the true crime that gave inspiration to the renowned movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is a 1974 horror film about a cannibalistic family living in the rural countryside of Newt, Texas. This film centers on a group of teenagers who stumble upon the Sawyer family on their travels after running low on gas. They become the unfortunate victims of a mute and awkward man named Leatherface. He earned this name because of his penchant for wearing his victim's skin on his face. Leatherface is seen in different faces throughout the movie, but one of his most iconic is the face of a woman, and this alludes to the story I'm about to tell you, the story of the serial killer Ed Gein, who inspired the movie. Grab your cup of coffee, curl up on the couch, and get ready for some true crime. Welcome to Coffee and Crime, where this week we are talking about the true crime that inspired the movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This week, joining me, I actually have a guest. So we're going to let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Gogo Merceau. I am Mercy Grimm's girlfriend. And I hate horror movies and <laughs> true crime kind of stuff. But she loves it. So we decided to be a funny mix if she would tell me about them. And I react to them. So thanks for having me on. Of course, and she'll be joining us every once in a while to give some interesting commentary to what we have to talk about. So, as stated, we are talking about Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield. He was born in La Crosse County, Wisconsin in 1906. While he was still young, his family sold their grocery store, which his father owned, Wait, this is going back all the way to 1906? Yes, back when crime wasn't as easily solved. Okay, why did I think this was a more recent thing? Uh, there's black and white photographs of the the house, so it's, um, it's very old. I mean, the movie came out, the Texas Chainsaw came out in, um, the 70s, so it had to have been an older crime. But, I'm sure there's a few serial killers this who've also done something similar to be fair i didn't even know it came out in the 70s i thought it came <laughs> out in like this <laughs> like well they did the 2000s they did do um they did do uh, a second movie to go along with the first one they did like two remakes and then they did a 3d movie which didn't do very well and they also did uh another remake just recently okay so I'm not crazy. No, 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 no. There's different <laughs> versions, but this one is the 1974 one. Okay. So this one is the oldest, like, the the baby of the series. Okay. The start of it all. So this, um, this man, Ed Gein, his family moved to Plainfield, Wisconsin when he was a child. They bought a farmhouse. And his mother was very devout, so, like, super hardcore religious. And she preached to him and his brother Henry that all women, except for herself, were bad and the instruments of the devil. She would constantly... Okay, there's a what? lot of reasons already so far <laughs> as to why he'd be a psycho killer. Can I just say, first of all, you're in Wisconsin. What is there to do in Wisconsin? <laughs> Let's start there. And then to have a crazy religious mother. Already another bad start. No offense to anyone who's religious, but like... You know, but to say that all women are of the devil besides, like, her? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so she would constantly read them Bible verses from the Old Testament relating to murder and death. So, you know, that also chalks up to it. Um, And uh, due to her overbearing nature, she kept the boys in their isolated farmhouse and only allowed them to leave for school. 
So at school, Gein was shy, socially awkward, and he laughed randomly as if making fun of his own personal jokes. See, I did that too, but it's just because I was remembering memes. But, no, like, there that, were no memes back then. That's not true. There were memes back then. Memes are historical. And there's always some generation sort of meme. I can get into the history of memes, but I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> I'm just saying, like. Well, you know, he was shy and socially awkward. It's the quiet ones. It's always the quiet ones. Uh, yeah, I wasn't quiet. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh. These are classic signs that there's something wrong with the person, like I said. He did not have any friends because his mother would not permit it, and she would actually punish him if he tried to make any friends. Damn. So basically, he could only have her in his life. That's because all women are the devil. Exactly. So, in 1940, Henry and Ed's... Henry and Ed's father, he died of heart failure due to his alcoholism issues, which he had. If she was my wife, I'd be drinking too, okay? <laughs> Just saying. Well, he wasn't the best of a parent either. He couldn't hold a job, like, at all. That's why they moved. Mm-hmm. So they took up odd jobs the sons did around the town to help their mother pay for the bills in the house. Uh, they would both work as handymen, but Gein would also babysit the local children. He seemed to relate more to children than he did adults, which is kind of weird, but I can kind of relate because I'm a well, teacher. Well, yeah, I yeah. can relate too. I'm a teacher yeah. as well. Like, But the way he went about it was a little, like, awkward. Like, he was more like a child himself than actually an adult being hanging out with children. Like, that's, I don't know if that's explainable, but it, it was in a weird way. It wasn't in, like, a, you're a teacher, that's kind of positive. Um... Henry had a lot of issues with the way that Ed was attached to their mother. So, like I said, she was uh, very adamant on them being only with her. And uh, he often spoke poorly of her in front of Ed, which angered him very much and shocked him a lot. Uh, he would Henry would later realize that this was actually a bad idea on his part. He really shouldn't have talked so poorly of their mother. I don't know if you've ever seen um, Hitchcock's movie Psycho. I have not. Um, the killer in that movie, Norman Bates, is mm-hmm. actually loosely based off of Ed Gein as well. Really? Because um, in the movie in Psycho, spoiler alert if you haven't seen Psycho, go see it. It's really good. Um, Norman would dress up as his deceased mother and kill people at the hotel. Oh, I think I knew that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's common knowledge. They made that TV show called The Bates Motel oh, not yeah. too long ago. Mm-hmm. That came out in, like, the mid-2000s, I think, on Netflix. But um, the original movie, the black and white, not the remake. That yeah. They, that remake was awful. So awful. Never watch the remake. Only watch the original Alfred Hitchcock uh, Psycho movie. That's that's a good movie. But, okay, back to, uh, back to Gene. So, in... 1944, um, him and his brother were burning away at the vegetation, the marsh vegetation on the farm, and the fire got out of control. So after a day of taking care of the fire, Ed reported that his brother was missing. Oh. <laughs> yes. Remember when I said he would uh, regret talking poorly of their mother? <laughs> He had apparently been dead for a while, and since he had not been um, burned by the fire, they assumed that he had died of heart failure since his father had heart failure. Yeah, but, like, how old was he at the time? Um, I believe at the time the boys were in their 30s, so they were adults. Okay, it's slightly reasonable, but still suspicious. Mm-hmm. Like, and they didn't think anything of that? Nope. Um, the assumption that they had that he died of some sort of natural cause would later prove to be wrong. Well, uh, yeah! <laughs> Look, like, as soon as they figured out what his brother was a serial killer, they're like, oh, maybe we should have been more suspicious of his brother's death. But, like, again, at the time they didn't know, so I guess whatever, but, like... So, yeah, they didn't want to place blame on the shy, timid person. Because, you know, um, Ed Keen came across as a very shy and timid person. They're like, oh, he can't do that. 
like I said, it's always the quiet ones, just saying. Um, so, it was actually later reported by someone who was there that Henry had bruises on his head, and uh, the police disregarded this report, and they had the coroner chalk it up his cause of death, death to asphyxiation, probably due to the smoke inhalation from the fire, but it's a little suspicious that he had bruises on his head. He got knocked with a rock, man. Probably, and then maybe he did die of asphyxiation because of the smoke inhalation because he was unconscious. In a fire. <laughs> yeah. So, um, sometime, sometime later after this incident, people did suspect Keen of killing his own brother. However, like I said, there were literally no charges brought against him. They really should have brought those charges against him. Uh. <laughs> Well, after his father and his brother had died, Keen and his mother were alone, and uh, not for long. Shortly after Henry's untimely death, Keen's mother actually had a stroke, after which um, Keen devoted all of his time to taking care of her. And not too long after that, another stroke befell her, and she died in 1945, so it was like a year after his mother. And Keen was now alone in the world, and he wasn't feeling very well. He was actually about it because you know his mother was his whole world but she was crazy and she wanted to be his whole world yeah didn't really think that through so definitely not <laughs> in uh in 1957 a woman named bernice warden went missing and uh it's not surprising most of his victims were women because considering the way his mother raised him you women know. are of the devil man um but there was a different factor involved with that that we'll get to in a minute <laughs> <laughs> Gein was immediately suspected of the murder or the disappearance when the son of Warden accused him of being the last person to see her alive. Uh, the kicker here is that Warden actually sold him antifreeze from her hardware store. Oh my that god. She disappeared from. So, <laughs> seriously, if you're gonna go kill a person, don't you think it's a little sketchy if you buy your cleanup supplies from them? I think it's poetic. I think he I... knew exactly what he was doing. And he was enjoying it. But was it smart? No, it no. wasn't smart. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could argue that he wasn't in his right mind. Because, you know, he's intent on murder. Well, no, I think he was in his right mind when he was doing it. Because, okay, if you want to romanticize murder and stuff like that, wouldn't you want to go and almost tease the victim without them knowing? Or do I sound like a psycho? <laughs> Um, I mean, you sound like you've been watching a lot of Criminal Minds, but... <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, it's not smart, but it's interesting that he did that. Interesting, yes. Definitely not smart, though, because back then they didn't really have the ability to do a lot of different testing for, like, crime-related things, but, you know, they could go back and look at receipts, so... Yeah, but it wasn't... It was easy to look at receipts because you had to do all of that stuff by hand. So, uh, Warden's body was actually found um, decapitated in a Ooh. shed on Keen's property. So they suspected him, searched his property, found her decapitated body. Uh, there's also a lot of other disturbing paraphernalia adorning Keen's home as well, they found. Um, this is actually where we see the connection between Ed Gein and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because um, the interior of his house and also somewhat the exterior, because I believe it was the same color, if I looked it up correctly, it was also white, just like Texas Chainsaw, and they're both also farmhouses. But um, the interior was decorated pretty much the same from the description of the Gein case. Um, basically, uh, just picture... Furniture, but made out of human skin. Delightful. Yes, very. You know, um, a picture. Uh, it better be moisturized. Otherwise, sitting on that is just not comfortable. Also, picture um, if you needed anything sturdy, they would probably have used human bones to make it. So, um, light fixtures, any like if they had a mobile at all, human bones. No. I mean, you gotta be talented to be a craftsman of that stuff. I, I mean, I gotta give him props. Like, he used all of his victims. Didn't waste. 
That's like a Native American thing that they do. You oh. never waste any part of the buffalo or anything that you hunt and kill. Was it creepy? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. But interesting fact Interesting fact about the Chainsaw movie is um, if you go back and look at any of the interviews, the director will tell you that it was all about meat and all about the idea of meat. Just like he actually went vegetarian for a year because of the movie a lot of the, the people, director yeah, a lot of the people who participated in the movie or who were a part of it who knew about it personally went vegetarian for a little while because they were so disgusted with the idea of meat but like human meat because, it is a little gross because in the movie there's a scene where we actually see what the kitchen looks like in the first one um where one of the female characters gets uh gets hung up by um those slaughterhouse hooks Ooh. And then later on, we actually see her. She's still alive, but we'd assume she died after um, her body. She was inside of um, one of those, like, long floor freezers. Yeah. She was still kind of alive when the final girl found her, but there was really nothing you could do for her at that point. So, there was this whole notion and idea of using meat, but human meat. Because they were a cannibalistic family. They were going to eat the um, people that they killed. And Leatherface just really liked wearing people's skin. Just like Ed Gein. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, um, like Leatherface, Gein also wore the skin of his victims. But unlike Leatherface, um, he wasn't covering up his deformity. Leatherface had a facial, like his facial and skin deformity. Like, he, he definitely had um, a lot of probably genetic stuff, because I would assume their family was also a bit incestual, but um, it's never, it's never talked about, but it's just... The way that his mom praised him and the way that he freaked out tells me there might have been some abuse. Oh, there was abuse in Ed Gein's life. His father... um, No, I'm talking, like, abuse from the mom in, like, a sexual way. Probably. But, um, the thing about Gein is, He wore woman's skin because he had a desire to be a woman himself because of his mother. Oh. Or or possibly (laughs) trans baby. I mean, at the time, they didn't know what trans really was openly. Well, yeah, obviously back in that time, it was like not really a thing that was discussed, but is it wrong that I feel sympathy that he might have been a poor trans baby? In a way, but you'll find out. I also he had other, other issues. issues. Yeah, yeah. I had no clue that he had other issues. So, um, now you're actually probably wondering how many people did Gene kill if he had so many body parts and pieces of skin in his home? How many people did he kill? This is interesting. This, the truth is, he didn't commit that many murders. Unlike the Sawyer family in Texas Chainsaw, uh, who killed for their food, cannibalistic family. Gein actually started his grotesque collection by grave robbing. That's more reasonable than murder, I would think. Yeah, but then he stepped up to murder later. Uh, He told police that after his mother's death, he wanted to create a woman's suit so he could literally crawl into her skin. It makes me cringe just to say that. Yeah, that's like a little nauseous making. Mm. And very uncomfortable. Too bad we didn't know what, really know what trans was back then. He could have just put on some drag, man. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> he probably did. We just have no evidence that he did. I mean, I'm sure he made the skin faces look nice. Oh, I'm sure. If you watch Texas Chainsaw, um, if you see one of the most iconic um, faces for Leatherface is his female face that he wears at some one point in the movie. Um, I'm... If I remember correctly, he did try and make it look nice. Here's my thing. I'm never going to watch this movie. And you know that I won't watch this movie. I'm just fascinated listening to this. (laughs) I could literally just, like, explain you piece for piece the movie so you never have to watch it. Because I don't think... I don't necessarily... I don't necessarily want to watch it. Like, I just find this stuff interesting. Like, I'll read about it. 
but I don't think I'd ever actually watch it because like I have a very visual memory and it'll freak me out. <laughs> so, so to answer our question, he actually only committed two murders. Oh, just two? Yeah. Um, well, that, and his brother. <laughs> well, technically, yeah, but he was never convicted of that, so they never actually. I'm counting it as three murders. He's yeah. three murders is nothing. Um. So it was that of Bernice Borden and mm-hmm. another woman named Mary Hogan. He later denied any remembrance of killing Mary Hogan the, at the time, but after he goes through his trial, he finally admits to it. So, uh, Gein was arrested, and his trial took place in 1957, where he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. I think the insanity thing shouldn't be a plea that you can even do, because, like, obviously you're crazy, that's why you should be, like, convicted. <laughs> well, it's not like he didn't, he's not like he could walk free to the public, I guess. Well, I would hope not. Um, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and uh, deemed unfit for trial, basically, is what happened. Again, I hate that that's an excuse, but again, if I ever go to jail, I need the excuse of, <laughs> <laughs> of my mental illnesses, so maybe I shouldn't blame him too much. Uh, he was sent to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, located in, I'm going to butcher this, but Wapoon, Wisconsin, and later transferred to Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. So in 1968, they decided that he was once again fit for trial, and his trial began in November. (laughs) I don't drink coffee, so I'm having some soda. (laughs) It smells great. It does smell great. She she has um pomegranate and dragon fruit seltzer water, everyone. Okay, continue to tell me the story yeah, while yes. I slowly open this and risk my life. <laughs> Though Gein admitted to two murders, he was still deemed incompetent due to his mental health. So he was issued to spend the rest of his days in a mental health institute. Gein died at the Mendona Mental Health Institute due to respiratory failure and lung cancer in July 1984 at the age of 77. Do you have any end thoughts? Oh, this is the end yeah, already? This is, this is the end. I feel like, first of all, three murders does not make a serial killer. It's like when it's seven crimes and they're smart. I feel that he was not smart in any of these crimes. No, he w- he definitely was more of a simple person. His motivation was interesting, though. I definitely think his motivation was interesting, the whole wanting to be a female kind of thing. It's just like, if trans had really been a known thing back then, maybe he could have been more accepted if he didn't have a psychotic mother. The schizophrenia didn't his case though well no it really didn't help his case but it also could have explained a little bit but at the same time i hate when mental illness is used as an excuse for that kind of stuff so tell me about this movie the movie oh yes tell me about this movie i've heard the crime yeah yeah, tell me the movie so texas chainsaw begins with this group of teenagers who are running low on gas their car they actually stop at a gas station fun fact about this gas station it's an actual place that you can actually go to it's not just a set piece for the movie the house was a set piece for the movie but this gas station still exists and uh it's gone through many different names but you can actually go there now and get like um when you say many different names all i can think of is that meme that says come and go (laughs) (laughs) again I am meme knowledge. You are spooky knowledge. Well, this place you can actually go there now and buy like um memorabilia like um like lanyards or like magnets or something that's like memorabilia for the movie. It's like going to a spooky store but just Texas James off. And they also have like signed like autographed photographs from some of the cast from the original movie as well, which is cool. kind of cool. Um but so they try to get gas in the gas station. They end up, uh, oh, and a spoiler alert for the movie, by the way. If you haven't watched it, I don't know why you're here. You should really go watch it and then come back. 
you can you can find it on like a streaming service right now. I'm sure someone's playing it because it's Halloween season. But um, anyway, they run low on gas. They're actually traveling because um, Sally and her brother Franklin. Franklin is um, wheelchair bound, mm-hmm. which, which makes for an interesting thing for the movie. Um, they heard that someone had been uh, grave robbing in the area. Uh, another allusion to Ed Gein, by the way. Um, and they wanted to make sure that their homestead was okay. So they were traveling there. And um, on their way, they found out at the gas station that they wouldn't be getting gas until later. They'd run out for the day. So they had to pull over. First of all, how does a gas station run out of gas? I'm sorry. It's I the, know it's a plot it's point. It's the 70s. <laughs> They were okay. different. Fine. They get deliveries in those trucks. Okay, still weird. Anyway. So they end up having to stop at this um this rundown looking farmhouse. Um and the couple, the girlfriend and boyfriend who are traveling with them, their friends, uh, they uh decided it'd be fun to just, you know, ex lower the area they actually go and go to see if anyone's home at the house except for sally she goes to do something else so one of the most um iconic opening scenes from the movie when they introduce leatherface is uh one of the characters um one of the lead male characters actually walks into the house and because the door is open and he's looking for someone and right as you go past the staircase there's this uh metal door he walks up to it, opens. Leatherface is right there. He clocks him with a meat cleaver, pulls him behind the door, and slams it shut. See, this is why you just don't walk into people's <laughs> houses. <laughs> like, yeah. this is why in the 70s everyone was getting murdered. Because, like, you didn't have people texting saying, like, oh, I'm here, open the door. Like, again, this is why serial killers got away with so much early on before all the technology got real fancy. Well, the um, one of the girls was waiting outside, and this is actually, when she walks into the house, this is actually one of the most famous shots from the movie. Um, it's, a, it's a down shot, so the camera is angled upwards and down, and um, it's her walking, and it gives you such a wide-angled view of what's happening. And um, the actress was so embarrassed because you could uh, see her ass so well on the screen. <laughs> and she's like, oh my goodness! In a later interview, she said that. But it's one of the most like iconic shots. They tried to reproduce it in the remakes, but they just couldn't make it again. It was just that that was the shot. But um, she ended up going inside, and uh, she's the one who gets uh, meat cleaver, like I was telling you earlier. And uh, so it's a slow build kind of movie. When Sally realizes what's happening, the lead actress, um, she, she decides to go back to the gas station to try and get help. Big mistake. <laughs> uh, one of the gas station attendant, or the owner of the gas station, is one of the Sawyer brothers, oh. one of the cannibalistic brothers, and uh, he captures her and brings her home to his two brothers and their father, or grandfather. He's very old. And um, she tries to escape. She, like, tries to hide in the house somewhere, but it, because she gets away from them at first. And we get, like, um, that final girl circuit where she sees some of the dead bodies and stuff. Yeah. Very iconic for horror movies. Like, open a door, boom, dead body. Open this, boom, dead body. Like, they do that in the Friday the 13th movies. All, like, all I know the context of, like, the final girl or whatever. Yeah, so Sally gets recaptured. Obviously, because she has literally no place to hide in this crazy house. By the way, when she's going through this house, we get those shots of, like, the set pieces that look like the scenes from the photographs of Ed Gein's house. Speaking of which, you have to show me the photographs, because I, I definitely think that I should react to I'm them gonna, as well. I'm going to show you. I have the link right here. And so she gets captured. She gets put at the dinner table. Um, and so Sally is freaking the, she's freaking out. She's freaking out, freaking that out. And here's, uh, here's his shots. Oh, cute little so, house. Yes. Ooh. They're looking inside to see. 
the atrocities of this. So, um, they find all these weird random things, and a lot of the stuff in the house, um, it, if you look at how disgustingly messy this house is, this house was. That looks like my room. <laughs> <laughs> and you've seen my room! You know it's bad! Um, some of the stuff that was in his house was, like, skin. Just hanging skin. He would make skin boots. That's skin. Ooh. That chair has skin on okay, it. Okay, here's my thing. If you have human skin furniture, does that mean that you have to moisturize it constantly? Or uh, does it, or do you not have to moisturize it constantly? I would not know because I do not have human skin furniture. I I'm just curious. No if anyone knows this, furniture. please email us or tweet us or Instagram us or Put leave it in a the comment. Comments. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Sally's trapped at the dinner table, and they want to eat her. They're a cannibal family, so they get... Looking like a snack! (laughs) (laughs) They get Grandpa to try and do the finishing blow with a hammer, and they push her head over a bucket, because they want to drain the blood out in the bucket, too. But he's not strong. It's actually very comedic. He cannot hit her. He's not strong enough. It's really funny. And, um, there's a whole struggle that happens during this. She actually does break free, and Leatherface is chasing her with a chainsaw at the end of the movie. That's that famous chainsaw. Yeah. The funny thing is the chainsaw is not there for the whole movie. It's just mostly used for very special scenes, like the ending scene. So um, he chases her out of the house with the chainsaw, trying to chase her down, scare her. There's actually a vehicle driving by on the road at the same time, a truck. She... Covered in blood, she's, like, hysterically, like, screaming at this point. She jumps into the back of this pickup truck, and he just misses her. Literally just misses chopping her with a chainsaw. And she's just sitting in, like, this fetal position in the back of the pickup truck as it's driving away, covered in blood, laughing at him hysterically as she sees him chasing the truck for just a minute, like, less than a minute, and then he does this crazy dance with his chainsaw, and then credits weird yeah so she's the only survivor from the whole thing out of all five of them okay so that is texas chainsaw thank you for telling me and that is also all the time that we have so it's been lovely having a guest on coffee and crime one who doesn't really know anything about what we're talking about. I think it was a delightful time. It was fun listening to you explain things and just being able to say my stupid comments. <laughs> so we will see you next week. It will probably just be me next week. Drop a comment if you want me more. <laughs> <laughs> Drop a comment if you want more partners in crime. That's what we're going to call this segment. Partners in crime, guys. So it's until, cute because we're partners in crime. We are, honey. <laughs> so until next time, everyone. Well, that was a whirlwind of a case. I definitely see the parallels between Gein and Leatherface when it comes to the content of the crimes, especially the use of human skin from their victims. If you want to see for yourself what Gein's house looked like on the inside and outside, I'll leave a link to a gallery of photos taken of it in the description below. Thank you for sticking around to hear about the infamous Ed Gein and the connection between his story and that of the famous movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Also, thank you to all of my new subscribers. Know that I appreciate you very much, and I'm glad you share the same enthusiasm for horror and true crime that I do. To everyone, Please give this video a like, and if you haven't already, subscribe and hit that notification bell for more true crime and horror movie content. I'll see you guys next time. Until then.